Again and again in these lectures, we have been able to show how the Genesis account, rightly interpreted, has corroborated the findings of clairvoyant investigation. However, there remain a number of points still to clear up in this regard. The first thing will be to show with greater precision the point of time at which the Genesis account falls in terms of what spiritual scientific findings tell us with regard to the origin of our earth. I have already referred to this from a certain aspect in that I placed the beginning of Genesis at the time when the sun and earth were about to separate, but we shall have to go into this in greater detail. Those of you who have heard some of my earlier lectures, and also those who have studied the description of earth evolution in my title Outline of Esoteric Science, will remember what great importance I attached to two significant moments in this evolution. The first of these is the separation of the sun from the earth. This moment is a very important one. This separation had to take place some time, for had the two cosmic bodies remained united, as they were at the beginning of earth existence, the course of human evolution could not have given man his true earthly meaning. All that we include in the term sun, obviously not only the elemental or physical constituents in the body of the sun, but also the spiritual beings belonging to it, had to withdraw from the earth, or, if you prefer, push the earth out. Because if those beings who have transferred their scene of action from the earth to the sun had remained with the earth, their forces would have had too strong an effect for man's well-being. They had to lessen their forces by removing themselves from the earthly scene and working upon it from outside. So, we are concerned with a point of time when, in order to reduce their influences, a number of beings set up their abode outside the earth and then worked less strongly on the development of both man and animal. From this moment in time onward, the earth is left to itself, and because the finer, the more spiritual forces have withdrawn with the sun, the earth forces undergo a certain coarsening. But man, after the separation of the sun, remained on the earth for a while, still as the being he had become as a result of the Saturn, sun, and moon stages. It was, of course, only highly exalted beings who withdrew with the sun and took up their scene of action outside the earth. When the earth was left on its own, however, it still had within it all the substances and forces which go to make up the present moon. After the separation of the sun, we, therefore, had an earth evolution which, so to speak, still had moon evolution within its own body. Man was exposed to conditions which were much coarser than earth conditions proper became later. For the substance of the moon is very coarse. Following on the separation of the sun from the earth, the earth forces, therefore, became ever more moon-like, ever denser. This then led to humans being exposed to the other danger of dying off, of mummifying astrally. While, so long as the sun remained with the earth, conditions were too refined, they now became too coarse. Consequently, as the development of the earth proceeded, human beings, by maintaining their connection with the earth, were less and less able to thrive. All this is described in detail in my title Outline of Esoteric Science. We know from yesterday's lecture that human beings were, of course, soul spiritual beings, and for this very reason they could not unite with the earth materiality which rose up into the periphery, because while the moon was still united with the earth, this was too coarse. So it came about that the great majority of human souls had to relinquish their union with the earth. 
Here we come to something of great importance affecting the relationship between human beings and the earth during the period of time between the departure of the sun and the departure of the moon. Except for a very small number, the sole spiritual part of human beings took their departure from earth conditions and made their way to higher regions where according to their level of development they continued their evolution on the planets belonging to our solar system. Some soul spirits were more united, excuse me, were more suited to pursue their evolution on Saturn for the time being, others on Mars, others again on Mercury, and so on. Only a very small number of the strongest soul spirits remained connected with the Earth, and in the meantime the rest dwelt upon Earth's planetary neighbors. This was at a point in time preceding the Lemurian Age to use the customary expression. So, what we can call our human soul condition went through an evolution on the neighboring planets of our Earth. Then came the other important event which took place, as we know, during the Lemurian Age, when the substance of the Moon and all its forces was removed from the Earth. The Moon departed from the Earth, bringing about great changes in the Earth itself. Now, for the first time, the earth came into a condition in which human beings could thrive. Whereas the forces would have been, so to say, too spiritual if the earth had remained united with the sun, they would have had to become too coarse had it remained united with the moon. Therefore the moon also withdrew and the earth remained behind in a state of balance brought about because sun beings and moon beings both influenced it from outside. The earth prepared itself in this way to be able to be the bearer of human existence. All this happened during the Lemurian age. Evolution continued and little by little the human soul spirits who had fled to the planets began to return to earth again. This return of the soul spirits from the neighboring planets is something that went on for a long time, far into the Atlantean age. Evolution happened in such a way that what had crystallized out as man during the latter part of Lemuria and during Atlantis was gradually endowed with soul spirits who had different characteristics according to whether they came down from Mars, Mercury or Jupiter and so on. This brought about great variety in man's earthly development. Those of you who are familiar with my last lectures in Christiania will know that this classification into a Mars type, a Saturn type, and so on, was the origin of what later became racial differentiation. This is how differences arose among the human race as a whole, and it is still possible today, if you have an eye for it, to recognize whether a person's soul has descended from this or that planet. But it has also been emphasized, and this has been fully discussed in my title, Outline of Esoteric Science, that by no means all human soul spirits left the earth. What we might describe as the toughest souls were able to go on using earthly matter and remain united with it. I have even mentioned that in a surprising way there is a principal human couple who survived the densification of earth. Spiritual investigation impels us to accept what to begin with seems incredible, that there was such a couple as Adam and Eve, as the Bible tells us, and that the races which arose on the return of soul spirits from the cosmos came about through their union with the descendants of that couple. If we bear all this in mind, then we shall approach an elucidation regarding the point of time in our spiritual scientific chronology to which the Bible account refers. Let me remind you that after the six or seven days of creation have been described, there comes what the superficial approach of modern biblical criticism takes for a second separate account of creation, but which in reality 
is a perfectly consistent part of it. I would like to men- remind you of some spiritual scientific results which I have often mentioned and described in greater detail in my title outline of esoteric science. I showed how during the advance of earth development, from the Lemurian to the Atlantean age, a kind of cooling down of the earth took place. During Lemuria we must think of the earth as an entity of an essentially fiery nature, with the element of fire flashing forth all over it. And it was not until the transition to Atlantis that the cooling down process began. During the Atlantean age, the atmosphere above the earth's surface was very different from what it became later. A long way into the Atlantean age, the earth's atmosphere was still densely humid. The earth was covered with an atmosphere that was totally saturated by something between water and fog. The difference that exists today between whether it is raining or whether the atmosphere is clear of rain did not exist in those ancient times. Everything was shrouded in watery fog, laden with all sorts of fumes and smoke and other substances which had not at that time assumed solid form. Much of what is solid today still streamed through the atmosphere in the form of steam and everything was pervaded by these masses of watery fog until far into Atlantean times. But that was the very period when, for the first time, what had previously existed in a much more spiritual condition began to take on physical form. During the situation as it was on the third day of creation, we must not think that the forms of individual plants, as we know them today, sprouted from the earth, but that we must give full weight to the phrase, quote, after his kind, close quote, meaning that the reference is, rather, to the souls of species which were present in the body of the earth in etheric astral form. What was described on the third day as the creation of plants would not have been visible to outer senses, but only to clairvoyant organs of perception. During the time lasting from the end of Lemuria right on into Atlantis, when the condition of fog developed in the periphery of the earth and then gradually thinned, what had previously been of an etheric nature became transformed into a condition somewhat resembling what we know today. What had been etheric became more and more physical. It may sound strange today, particularly as geology is largely pervaded by materialistic viewpoints, but the kind of plant kingdom visible to the external eye did not come into existence until much later than the time indicated in the account of the third day of creation. It did not come about until the time of Atlantis. The geological conditions necessary for today's plants must not be ascribed to these very early times in our investigation. The course of events from the end of Lemuria on into Atlantean times could be characterized as follows. The earth was covered by dense volumes of fog in which the various substances later to be transformed into the crust of the earth were still in the form of smoke. And the beings of species visible to clairvoyant consciousness had not yet achieved physical densification. The fertilizing of the earth's surface with the water hovering in the air had not yet taken place. That only happened later. How could the Bible give the first mention of this? It would have, it would have to say at a different point, quote, even after the conclusion of the seven days of creation, After what coincides with the Lemurian age had taken place, still none of the plants we know today sprouted from the earth, and the earth was still covered with fog. The Bible does in fact say this. If you read on, after the seven days of creation, you find it mentioned that there were still no herbaceous plants or shrubs on the earth, although it had been said earlier that the plant forms had arisen as species. 
On the first occasion, the reference was to souls of the species, and the second time to something which sprang from the earth as a vegetation in individual physical form. The Atlantean fog is described as in fact it was after the days of creation. The words, quote, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, close quote, indicate that it was only after the days of creation that the condensation of the water in the atmosphere to rain came about. There is deep wisdom hidden here. But I can assure you that nothing from this document influenced the description I gave in Title and Outline of Esoteric Science. I purposely refrained from consulting the Bible, and there were times, I might say, when I had to try very hard to reach these things in a different way than from this ancient document. Modern materialistic ideas of the Bible make it inevitable that one should not readily read into it any of the facts of spiritual science. But spiritual science compelled us to find in the Bible what we have been able to say in these lectures. And despite our own reluctance, we have been obliged at last to recognize in the Bible what clairvoyant investigation had previously discovered. Having sorted this out, we may now go on to ask where in the Genesis account do we have to place the departure of human spirit souls to the neighboring planetary bodies or planetary beings caused by the hardening condition of the earth? We have to put it at the point where it says that through the formation of the sound ether the upper substances are separated from the lower ones. I went into that fully in my description of the second day. If you follow all this with the eye of a seer, you realize that along with what withdrew from the earth, which the Elohim called heaven, in quotes, there withdrew at the same time the soul spirits of human beings. Therefore, the second day of creation coincides with a specific period between the withdrawal of the sun and the withdrawal of the moon. However, we must bear in mind that this had a very important follow-up. What exactly was it that went out into the cosmos at that time? In other words, where do we find it today in human beings? In which members of the human being do we expect to locate it? Of course, it does not exist today in the form it had in those times. But we can, nevertheless, find something corresponding to it in a certain part of our present human organization. Let us have a look at the human being with that in mind. Nowadays we distinguish in the human being the four familiar members, the physical, etheric, and astral bodies, and the bearer of the ego. We know that during sleep the physical and etheric bodies remain in bed. When we are concerned with those ancient times which apply to the second day of creation, and even the third as well, we should not speak of physical and etheric bodies as we know them today. These were only formed out of earth substance later. All there was of the human being at that time belonged to what nowadays withdraws from the coarser members of his being what we call his astral being. It is the forces at work in our astral body that we must have in mind when we think of the human soul spirit which took leave of the earth at that time in order to thrive better on the surrounding planets. It is all that belongs to our forces when our astral body is outside our physical and etheric bodies that we have to expect to find on the surrounding planets after the second day. We know, however, that when, nowadays, the human being, in the state of sleep, is outside his physical and etheric bodies, he becomes part of the astral environment of our earth, of the forces and currents of the members of our planetary system. During sleep, human beings are in connection with planetary beings. So, we can say 
that in those ancient times human beings were not only united with these planets outside during sleep, but after this flight from the earth they were united with them all the time. They stayed there. Therefore we have to bear in mind that during the third day of creation human soul spirits, with the exception of those I mentioned who survived earth conditions, were not on the earth at all, but they settled on the planets surrounding the earth and underwent further development there. In the meantime, the strongest, toughest human soul spirits continued developing on earth, and their development consisted in clothing themselves more and more with earthly material, so that there below on the earth the first models were coming into being of the etheric and physical bodies we now live in during the day. It was in order that these etheric and physical bodies should be able to play their part in every situation of earth evolution that some of the soul spirits were kept alive on earth. By that means, the etheric and physical bodies, which were in the process of being prepared, were propagated even while the moon forces were still united with the earth. If we take a really good look at the state of things after the separation of the sun, we have to say that most of the substance of human soul spiritual nature was in the periphery of the earth on the neighboring planets. The sun had already departed from the earth, but if a human being had been able to station himself on the earth at that time, he would have seen upon its surface dense masses of a mixture of fog, smoke, and steam. He would have seen no trace of the sun. The sun's forces were far away. And only little by little did they begin to have the effect on earth of clearing up the masses of smoky fog and bringing the atmosphere into a condition necessary for human evolution. Our imaginary person, looking at evolution from outside, would have seen that it was only very gradually that the fog began to clear and the volumes of smoke to thin out, and the forces of the sun now began no longer to work their way through a dark covering of smoke, but to be perceptible, actually visible. We are now approaching the fourth day, and getting closer and closer to the event we call the separation of the moon. So, our imaginary human being would actually have caught sight of the rays of the sun penetrating through the volumes of smoke and steam. And while this was happening, the earth gradually assumed a condition favorable to human development, so that human beings could once again live on earth. The physical descendants of those who had survived in earth bodies could now provide bodies for the soul spirits who began to return from the periphery of the earth. So we have two kinds of propagation. What later became human etheric and physical bodies were passed down by those who had remained on earth. The soul spiritual part comes in from the periphery of the earth. To begin with, this arrival from the circles of the planetary neighbors of our earth was a spiritual influence. At the moment when the sun had penetrated the clouds of steam and smoke in the earth's atmosphere and the moon had departed, there awoke in the soul spirits on the planets the urge to come down again into the earthly realm. When, on the one hand, the sun became visible on the earth, and on the other hand also the moon, that was the time when the forces of the souls streaming down to earth entered the earthly sphere. This is the re reality behind the words used to describe the fourth day of creation, quote, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, close quote for the stars actually mean the planetary neighbors of our earth. The creative deed which brought about a kind of balance was set going on the one hand by the sun and on the other by the moon. 
And at the same time, the human soul spirits who were seeking to reincarnate on earth began to exert their influence. This places the fourth day of creation at a point in the Lemurian age when, after the exit of the moon, those conditions came about which you find described in my title Outline of Esoteric Science, and which we can sum up in the words, quote, The human soul spirits are seeking to return again to earth, close quote. But now we must give a little thought to the accompanying spiritual conditions. We have just been looking more at what was heading toward becoming physical. We must realize more and more clearly that everything coarse has a refined element behind it, and everything that is moving toward becoming physical has a spiritual side. With the exit of the sun, the Elohim in the main left the earth to set up their scene of action outside it so as to be able to influence it from the periphery, but not all of them went. A part of the Elohim remained united with the earth, even while the earth still had the moon forces within it. Part of the spiritual forces of the Elohim remained united with the earth, that part which, in a way, is bound up with all the good effects of the moon forces. For we must speak of good moon influences too. After the separation of the sun, everything on earth, especially human beings, would have been driven into a state of mummification, of hardening. The human being would have been lost to the earth. The earth would have become a desert waste if it had retained the moon forces within it. Within the earth the moon forces would never have been beneficial. Why was it then that they had still to remain on earth for a while? As humankind had to endure every kind of earth condition, its toughest representatives actually had to go through this moon densification. But when the moon had departed from the earth, its forces, which otherwise would have led to the death of the earth, became beneficial. After the withdrawal of the moon forces, everything revived again, so that even the weaker souls could descend and incarnate in human bodies. Therefore, by becoming its neighbor, the moon became earth's benefactor, which from within the earth it never could have been. The beings who directed this whole series of events are the great benefactors of humankind. Which beings were these? They were the very beings who had just united themselves with the moon and who then, as it were, tore the moon out of the earth in order to guide humankind further in in earth evolution. We recognize from the Genesis account that the Elohim were the great directing forces, and the Elohim forces which brought about the mighty event of the moon's withdrawal and thereby enabled human beings to assume their proper nature were none other than the very forces which brought about the cosmic advancement of the Elohim to Jehovah Elohim. This unified group remained united with the moon and was what drew it out of the earth. Therefore we can conclude that what we call Jehovah Elohim is intimately connected with what we know as the body of the moon within the created world. Let us now picture to ourselves more exactly what these circumstances actually signify for man on earth. If the human being had remained bound to an earth which had retained the sun within it, he would have become a nothing. He would have simply remained attached to the umbilical cord of the Elohim and would not have been able to sever this bond and attain his independence. But because the Elohim withdrew from the, earth, from the earth with the sun, human beings could remain with the earth and maintain their life of soul and spirit. If things had stopped there, however, human beings would have become hardened and found their death. Why did human beings have to reach a condition which provided even the possibility of dying off? So 
that they could become free, cut themselves off from the Elohim and acquire independent being. In his moon part, the human being has something within him which actually causes this dying off. And he would have had too large a dose of it if the moon had not separated from the earth. But you will see that it follows that it is the very moon element which, as a cosmic substance, is intimately connected with human independence. If you look at present conditions on earth, you must realize that these actually only came about after the moon's separation. So there is not so much moon activity left in the present state of things as there used to be. As far as the foundations of his physical and etheric bodies are concerned, however, man has survived the period when the earth was united with the moon, and therefore he has within him something of what has taken excuse me, something of what was taken from the earth and is now up there on the moon. He has retained it in his physical and etheric bodies ever since. Therefore man has a bit of moon nature in him and this is how he made his connection with it. The earth could not have stood having this moon element within it, but in a certain way man has it in him. He has the disposition to be something more than only an earth being. If you think about all this, then you realize that as human beings we, so to speak, have the earth beneath us, and that the moon had to be cast out of this earth, but it was not thrown out until the right dose of its nature had been inoculated into man himself. The earth does not contain any moon nature in it. It is we who have it in us. What would have become of the earth if the moon had not been torn out of it? Look at the moon for a moment with rather different eyes, the way people so often do today. Its whole material constitution is different from that of the earth. From a grossly material aspect, the astrophysicist says that the moon has no air and scarcely any water, that is, that it is far denser than the earth meaning that it contains forces which would have brought the earth beyond the condition of densification, which it actually has, and made it physically even harder than it is. The moon forces would make the earth physically harder, more fissured than it is. To have a picture of what the earth would become if the moon forces were in it, Think of a wet and muddy lane becoming dustier and dustier as the water in it evaporates. You can see the whole process happening when after a fall of rain the mud in the lane gradually turns to dust. Something like that would have happened to the earth on a large scale if the moon forces had remained within it. It would have cracked and crumbled into lumps of dust. Something like this will happen to the earth some day when it has fulfilled its task, it will crumble into cosmic dust. Earthly matter will dissolve as cosmic dust into cosmic space when man has finished evolving upon it. We can say then that the earth would have become dust, that it had the tendency to become dust, to crumble into particles of dust. It has only been saved from doing so too soon by the withdrawal of the moon. But in man something has remained of the disposition to become dust. Through the situation I have described to you, man received into his being something of this moon-like earth dust. Those beings connected with the moon actually introduced into man's bodily nature something which is basically not of the earth as it is after the separation of the moon. And as we experience it in our immediate surroundings, they have imprinted into the human body something of the moon-like earth dust. However, as Jehovah Elohim is connected with this moon nature, it means that it is Jehovah Elohim who has imprinted this moon-like earth dust into the human body. So, there must have been a point in the course of earth evolution of which it would be correct to say that during the cosmic advancement of the Elohim Jehovah Elohim, excuse me, that during the cosmic advancement of the Elohim, 
Jehovah Elohim imprinted earth dust into the human body, moon-like earth dust. This is the tremendously profound meaning in the passage in the Bible which says that Jehovah Elohim formed man of the dust of the earth. For that is what it says. None of the translations which convey that Jehovah Elohim formed man out of a, quote, a clod of earth, close quote, make any sense. What Jehovah Elohim did was imprint earth dust into man. Not a few of the startling discoveries we have already made have filled us with such awestruck veneration in regard to the revelations uttered in the Bible by the ancient seers and rediscovered in our own day by spiritual scientific research. But here with the words, quote, and Jehovah God, excuse me, and Jehovah Elohim imprinted into man's bodily nature the moonlike earth dust, close quote, the account given by the clairvoyant authors of Genesis may well inspire in us a sensation of almost overwhelming reverence. If those ancient seers were aware that the inspiration to which they gave utterance came to them out of the very regions where the Elohim and Jehovah Elohim were active, if they were consciously receiving their wisdom from the realms of the world creators themselves, then they would say, quote, What streams into us in the form of knowledge, wisdom, thought, is of the essence of that which through its creative activity formed the living being of the earth. Close quote. Therefore we can look up in holy awe to those ancient seers who themselves in holy awe looked up into those regions from which they received their inspiration, the realm of the Elohim and Jehovah Elohim. What name could they have given to those beings who underpinned both the creation and their own knowledge of it? What kind of word could there be for them unless it were one that conveyed the full force of their hearts on receiving this revelation from the powers that created the world? Looking up to these beings, they said to themselves, quote, This revelation flows down to us from divine spiritual beings. We can find no other word for them than the one that expresses our feeling of holy awe. Close quote. If we translate that into ancient Hebrew, what does it sound like? Quote, Those for whom we feel holy awe, Elohim. This is the Hebrew word for those beings for whom man feels holy awe. Close quote. Here you have the link between the feelings of the ancient seers and the name of those cosmic beings to whom they attributed both the creation and the revelation they received.